All from right. us. He can go on. Okay. Yeah, so uh, hi, my name is Tilman Scheller. I work in the Samsung Open Source Group, and I'm here today to talk about JerryScript. So I'll start off just um, talking a little bit about JerryScript, uh, what it does, um, how it works, and so on. And then I'll show you a, a quick demo there, set up in, on the table there in front already, and then we'll have time for a couple of questions. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, essentially, what is JerryScript? JerryScript is a really lightweight JavaScript engine. So um, we developed that from scratch and really with the goal of having an engine that can run on, on really resource-constrained microcontrollers. So devices, let's say, I think like 32K of RAM is, is what you need to do something uh, which is not just a hello world. So for a, a hello world, you right now you need uh, 3K of RAM. So that's basically the bare minimum of memory that you need on the device. And uh, yeah, uh, as I said, originally it was developed uh, by Samsung, uh, but now we have a, a small community around it various different companies contributing and um, it's an open source project so it's released under the Apache license 2.0 and uh, you can find it on github and yeah so um, yeah one, one of the the first questions usually we get when we talk about JavaScript is that people ask why do you even want to run JavaScript on a microcontroller why not just use C and uh, the our mo motivation for that is that uh, JavaScript is such a popular language and it's really easy to to use uh, and, and to learn and there are so many um, developers out there that we just want to give them a way to develop for small um, low-end IoT devices in the languages they're used to and uh, and uh, yeah with the tools that they're used to so that's kind of our core motivation for doing this and um, the other thing is that in this segment like small IoT connected devices running on a microcontroller you typically are not really um, you don't really run performance critical code there right so it's more like control tasks pulling some sensor sending some network messages and uh, so there you can also at least to a certain extent get away with the inherent performance overhead uh, a JavaScript engine uh, always has and uh, the the other thing is that or the, the hope is that JavaScript being a higher level language than C, you, you can be more productive, you can uh, write the code faster, develop your um, application faster, and, and also your products and get them shipped faster. So that's kind of the, the, the hope there. And uh, another interesting aspect is that uh, with JavaScript, it's also really easy to just load some code over the web. And uh, so you could think, for example, have a small microcontroller and then run an, a web server on that, like a really, really simple uh, light wide one, and connect with a web browser and enter some JavaScript code, execute it live on the device, and maybe interact with some peripherals connected to the microcontroller. So that's something, especially for prototyping, I think that uh, would be an interesting use case. And that's very easy to do with JavaScript, but if you want to do this with C, uh, this will be much more complicated. So that's, that's kind of when the dynamic nature of JavaScript uh, helps a bit there. So, um, yeah, just a, a couple of um, like kind of the key characteristics of JavaScript to give you a better idea. Uh, essentially, the, the single, most single most important optimization goal is to have a low memory footprint because that's typically the resource you are m the most constrained on the device. Uh, we also care a lot about performance and the code size of the engine itself, but uh, a lot of the optimizations are really targeted to keeping the, the memory usage uh, as low as possible. And that's also why we do things like, uh, so we don't do any just-in-time compilation. We just don't have enough space for that. So uh, we, we just have an, a classic interpreter which executes the, the JavaScript uh, bytecode and all those things. And uh, to achieve 
uh, the, the low memory footprint, we do various different things. So one thing is that we have a very compact uh, object representation. So all the, the data structures that we need in the engine to represent uh, JavaScript objects. So that is very much optimized to be as compact as possible. And then we, we also do things like uh, pointer compression. So internally on our heap, we uh, use 16-bit pointers, even though we typically execute on a 32-bit host. So uh, that way, especially for pointer-heavy programs, we, uh, we save a lot of memory because essentially our, our pointers are half the size than they would, would be uh, regularly. So uh, obviously there, you have to pay the price in, in terms of whenever there's a access to memory, you have to uh, compress or decompress the pointer. But uh, what, from what we've seen is still the trade-off is still, if you are on a constrained device, this still pays off overall. And uh, for people who, who don't want to use compressed pointers, we also have an option to turn that off. And that also gives you a larger address space. So right now with pointer compression turned on, you can just address 512K of uh, memory, which is for most of the really small devices just fine. But uh, yeah, if you have a device with two megabytes and, and you really want to use that, then uh, you, you can also turn it off. In terms of translation from the sources to the bytecode that we actually execute, there's uh, we try to be as lightweight as possible, so we go while we are parsing, we are already creating the, the bytecode instructions, and we are not uh, having any intermediate uh, representations in between. So we don't even construct an AST. So AST stands for abstract syntax tree. So we go straight while we parse, we already create the bytecode. And uh, at, the, at the very core of the engine is uh, the compact bytecode of JavaScript. So that's also what uh, one of the key features uh, that makes JavaScript successful. So this is essentially, uh, we have like, I think like two or 300 different uh, bytecode operations that represent common uh, constructs in JavaScript. And then we don't execute them directly. We, we decompose them into up to five kind of atomic operations which are much more simple. And those are in implemented by the interpreter. And yeah, this, this whole setup gives us a, a very, very compact representation on the bytecode level. A uh, couple more things about JavaScript. So it's uh, it's written in pure C99. So we really try to keep it that way and not use any GNU extensions, just to make it as portable as possible. So that as long as your platform has a C99 compliant compiler, that you can just build it and and it will work just fine. Uh, code size? Why no? Uh, the source code. We are currently at. 91,000 lines of code, so we're getting close to 100,000 lines of code there. And uh, the code size, so the size of the JavaScript binary itself, that is at uh, 133k right now on Thumb2. And this is with the full profile, so the whole um, language standard. Uh, if we, we also offer a minimal profile where some of the features are dropped, and then you can even get below 100k. And this number is important because that's essentially the amount of flash that you need on the device to get JavaScript running. And it's also, in a way, the, the overhead um, in terms of flash memory that you have to pay for using JavaScript versus uh, a native C application. One important thing to mention is that JavaScript really implements the full ECMAScript 5.1 standard, so we implement uh, all of that. And we also have the corresponding test 262 results. So this really works. We passed the conformance test suite. And uh, the another thing is the our C API. So if you have an existing application and you want to add some scripting capabilities to it, then you can uh, use the C API for that. Or the other way around, if you have a JavaScript application and you want to invoke some native code, then you can also do this through the C API. And another feature is the 
bytecode snapshot feature. So that one is uh, allows you to essentially pre-compile your JavaScript sources into the compact bytecode format. And you could even just deploy the bytecode rather than uh, even the sources. And this has a couple of advantages. So one of them is that you um, the whole process is a bit faster because you don't need to pass the code again. You can do that offline essentially, but that's usually not almost not even noticeable the difference. The the other benefit is that you can, if you pre-compile the, the bytecode, you can offload it into flash memory. And this is very useful because if you have, let's say you have some library code written in JavaScript that is not changing very often, then you can just pre-compile it to the compact bytecode and you can put it into flash memory and you can execute it directly from flash and that way you reduce the pressure of on the on the overall main, main memory. So uh, yeah, that's quite a nice feature. And uh, yeah, portability, so this is also very important. So we try to be as portable as possible so JavaScript can run on, on all different platforms and, and boards and so the the engine is designed to be fully self-contained so we don't even have uh, dependencies on the C standard library we have our own really small C standard library so it's really just some essential functions that we have in there and because of that you can also just run it uh, bare metal you don't need any operating system or uh, runtime support from the from the operating system and uh, out of the box, we support a couple of different boards. So the, the first one that we supported was the STM32F4, uh, but we have a couple more. So for example, the Arduino 101, that's an x86-based board. Intel contributed that port and maintains it. And then we have also the uh, Freedom, Freedom board from NXP. And uh, Photon board, so I'll say a bit more about that uh, in a couple of slides. And we also have an experimental port for the ESP8266. And for in terms of real-time operating systems, we have support for NADX, for Zephyr, Embed OS, and Riot. And if you want, you can run it on uh, on a desktop operating system as well. And that's particularly useful if you want, for example, you want to debug an issue in JavaScript. Then on the desktop, you have usually better debugging capabilities than on a small microcontroller, especially if things like uh, Walgrind or um, address sanitizer. If you want to track memory corruption bugs, then that's much easier to do on the desktop than uh, on, the, on the small devices. Yeah, so just, just to give you an idea what kind of hardware we're targeting, so the, the Photon board is essentially um, a $20 Wi-Fi enabled IoT board and uh, that one has uh, 100, uh, um, Codex M3 clocked at 120 megahertz, has a megabyte of RAM and 128K of Oh, one megabyte of flash, 128k of RAM. So that on that board you can already uh, do quite a lot with JavaScript. So at 128k, uh, you can run substantial amount of, of JavaScript. So in the demo, I also using the photon, so I can show it to you there as well. So. Uh, yeah, just to give you an idea of how little memory it consumes in practice, uh, I want to show some slides about uh, measurement results. So this is the, sure if you, yeah, should be readable, I guess. So for the, um, so this is memory consumption for the SunSpider benchmark, and uh, we are comparing JerryScript versus duct tape. Duct tape is uh, another open source lightweight JavaScript engine, so in, in a way it's a competitor to JerryScript. And uh, what you can see here is essentially, so the, the, the red bars are the memory consumption of duct tape, the blue bars are the bars uh, represent JavaScript memory consumption and you can see that we fairly uh, consistently are significantly below what duct tape consumes. So that was not always the case like that but we spent pretty much the whole last year we spent a lot of optimization so we optimized for memory consumption and uh, also performance you will see that in the next slide. Uh, so yeah, right now we are, we are doing uh, significantly better and if, if you look at cases like this here, the date format uh, benchmark, we are really yeah, easily in order of magnitude better. Um, and performance wise it looks quite similar, it's, the difference is not as big as uh, on the memory consumption side, 
but um, yeah, there's even one benchmark here where we are pretty close, but on average we're like two times faster than duct tape, so uh, then you can see we spend a lot of time on that. So um, demo. So I have set up a, a small demo there, and I'll just uh, explain you a little bit what's, what devices are there. So essentially, um, it's a multiplayer Pong implementation, so very classic uh, game. And we have two devices. So we have the Raspberry Pi here, and we have a photon board. And each of them is connected to an LED matrix co uh, connected via I squared C. So you can see that there already. And uh, then we run, so all of, all of the code that's running is JavaScript and uh, we on, on the Pi we run just Linux and then JavaScript on top of it and on the Photon we run JavaScript on top of Riot and we're using Riot because for the communication we're using 6 low pan. so uh, Riot has a very good uh, stack for that. Um, and that's why we're going with Riot here. And, and the other thing to mention is that each of the device can, so it can be controlled by a human player, that's why we have the, the keypad on the Pi and uh, switches on the, on the Photon. But you can also run it in AI mode where just the computer opponent is playing. So yeah, so maybe I'll just show it to you if it still works. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so now basically um, both devices are um, in AI mode, and uh, you can see that this is the, ah, so the AI is not perfect, so sometimes one device wins. And uh, so this is the photon board, so you can see it's really small. The, the flashing LED means that uh, whenever there's a uh, six low pan packet being transferred, um, the, the LED gets toggled. And uh, since the, the board just has Wi-Fi built in, we have to use an 802.15.4 transceiver for the, uh, yeah, for the communication. And uh, that one is just, this is just a regular um, Open Labs uh, 802.15.4 shield, so the same one that we're using on the, on the Pi. And this one is just hooked up via SPI, and that works actually quite well. Yeah, and this is just regular Pi, so maybe I'll just start playing myself. Ah, lost. <laughs> okay, I need to practice more. Yeah, and you see, so the, the ball essentially passes over the network, and um, it's very smooth. So obviously, it is, since it's, uh, okay, now I turn on the AI mode again. So obviously, since it's six low pan, it's a lossy protocol, so maybe not the perfect protocol for this kind of use case, but uh, it works quite well in practice, actually, and uh, yeah, can play a little bit more here. Okay. Yeah, that's it pretty much for my side. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. So it looks like we have still seven minutes for questions. Uh, yeah. Yes. Um, after uh, your talk last year, uh, yeah. the same day, uh, me and I, with Peter, we, we tried uh, uh, JavaScript. Okay. Uh, we tried to make an open WT package. Uh, I think we got to the point where the MIPS architecture we tried to. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, those MIPS, uh, there was a problem there. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know what's the status with it. Um, and the second thing yes. is, we try to contribute uh, very simple things like uh, fix a little bit of the README and things like that. And the pull request was like for a simple re for a simple change. Like I think it was two three lines of change. This was was horrible discussion. Um, <laughs> <laughs> One thing we, and I think I will mention it in my talk uh, this evening, he, he was uh, very frustrated about this uh, merging process that got some kind of uh, uh, lengthy uh, uh, debated by multiple employees of Samsung <laughs> in, in Hungary. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think there we saw a problem with your contribution policy uh, I mean it was a simple simple example on how to, to run it so I would encourage you to work on that 
Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah so I, I'll just repeat yeah. the question. So, so just the short summary, uh, he tried to contribute some small changes to JavaScript and it didn't work as smooth as expected. So, um, yeah, essentially, uh, I guess that was still very much in the beginning of the year, right? So, so we have improved a lot, I think, on the, on the overall contribution process and also how the things get merged. And we, I think at that time we didn't even have any contribution guidelines or anything. So um, if you look at it now, you can see that we, we actually have quite a good throughput and also the time uh, between a pull request being sent and it getting merged. Obviously it depends on the size of the change, but now I think if you would do the same again now, probably it will be merged in, in, a, yeah, in a day or two. So, uh, I question about MIPS. Oh yeah, yeah, right. So the other question was um, that JavaScript didn't work on MIPS. So um, that's pretty much still the case. So no one has really, I mean, we haven't gotten really any interest in uh, in MIPS specific boards. So uh, at least from the Samsung side, we're not working on that. And also from the community, we haven't really seen any further uh, steps in that direction. But we would obviously be open to that. I, so. I, I tried because the, uh, I wanted to have uh, JavaScript on OpenWRT for all the different architectures. And ah, okay. the architecture for routers is MIPS. Right, so, yeah. Uh, I think on ARM it was working fine. Mm -hmm. On uh, other ARM 9, ARM 7, uh, yeah, we, we don't really test on MIPS or even build. Yeah. Okay, next question. Who was, f I don't know, maybe you? <laughs> yeah, uh, we, so the question was whether we did any um, memory consumption or performance measurements against uh, the established desktop <coughs> engines like V8 or uh, SpiderMonkey or JavaScript Core. Uh, we have done some measurements a while ago um, on memory consumption and there typically the, the minimum footprint you have is like 8 megabyte so there's no way you can scale that down. And performance wise I think we are at least I would say like a hundred times slower or something like that. So on the desktop I would only recommend usage if performance is not your uh, primary goal. Yeah. Okay, next question? Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, so one of the nice things about JavaScript is the ecosystem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, do you find that you're able to use things like the various different NPM packages or do the uh, requirements of the device mean that you have to write a lot of custom code? Yeah. So, th so the question was um, that JavaScript is a lot about the ecosystem, and the question is whether we it's easy for us to use existing code or like npm packages, things like that. So we essentially we've been pretty much focusing on on getting the engine uh, to a level where it's competitive against the other engines out there and so on. Um, we. We also have a framework called IoT.js, which essentially is like a lightweight version of Node.js for um, for running on top of JavaScript. But that's still um, so. Development last year was not really going strong, so it's still I would say still kind of in the early stages. Um, but um, a framework which is which is a bit more mature is uh, Zephyr.js. So Intel developed um, basically or yeah <coughs> JS API for Zephyr, and uh, they've been working that on that um, quite a lot last year. So so that definitely works, but I think there's still still kind of um, early days in terms of JavaScript frameworks um, targeted at really those low end devices. Um, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. One more minute. One minute forty. There's a question. There. Yeah. One more question. Yeah. Uh, so I, I haven't uh, known that before. So for me, the question is, what is what is exactly at the moment the community setup? Is it like what is the governance process? Are you part of a foundation? Yeah. Mm -hmm. is, uh, are you transferring into a foundation? Is it yeah. just a few Samsung? Yeah. And do we have currently other participants? Yep. Okay, so, so the question was um, in terms of like governance of the project or how the project is organized. And 
Essentially, so we um, just in September last year, we moved JavaScript over to the JS Foundation. So the JS Foundation is it's also a relatively new foundation um, uh, covering kind of all the different JavaScript projects and it came out of the jQuery Foundation. And um, in, in terms of governance, we, we have contributors from various different companies. So uh, Intel is a strong contributor, ARM, um, Linaro, Pebble uh, was a, a big user of JavaScript. Unfortunately, they got acquired by Fitbit, but they were actually using JavaScript already in production on their uh, smartwatches. So uh, that was quite interesting. Uh, but yeah, yeah, in terms of governance, we have um, we we are kind of growing and. Right now, still, the, a lot of the core maintainers are employed by Samsung, but we are slowly um, getting more, appointing more people um, to, from other companies and kind of diversifying the community. And the, the code, I mean, it's Apache 2.0, and it has been, all the IP has been transferred to the JS Foundation, so this is not, not really a Samsung project anymore. Yeah. Okay. Okay, I think we're done. <laughs> Do I, we have time for uh, one more. Yeah. Ah, okay, so it's, yeah, sure. Is there uh, any any plan to cover ECMAScript six? Yeah. So the question is if there are any plans to uh, work on ES6 features. So uh, we actually have started already, or uh, not not Samsung, but uh, people from Intel have contributed some some early ES6 features already. So we are certainly open to contributions in that area, and and we've also been working on uh, support for promise. Um, so yeah, that's definitely something uh, we are interested in, and also the community seems to be quite interested in. Yeah. Okay. Thanks okay. a lot. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs>